Ahoy there, folks! I'm Arlian, and welcome to this week's episode of Crit Hit Interviews, where we'll be hashing it out with Jason of Household Games. Hey, my name is Jason Canham. I'm the founder and director of Household Games, an uh, indie developer based out of Toronto. And uh, in 2018, we released Way of the Passive Fist. Which stole any sort of pun that I wanted to make for the review, because uh, <laughs> not that I realized it until several months later. That's our that, that's our favorite aspect, actually, is the duration of time, because we've gotten everything from, you know, instantly to we there was people that we were working with who helped us make the game who six months into making it were like, wait a minute, I just got the title. And that uh, that filled us with a lot of joy. That that made us realize it was something special. We like that. I mean, I I approve because I approve of all <laughs> puns. But I just <laughs> was playing it one day. I'm like, because I try and make stupid puns for all the games. I'm just like, wait a second, wait a second. The entire time, I never noticed. Oh, that that makes me happy. Thank you. <laughs> now. Given that the folks who are going to be watching this interview will no doubt have their own questions about the game and, you know, the devs, I figure we ought to get down to business, though I will be starting off with something easy. Uh, in this case, what's your favorite brawlers, considering the genre that way the pacifist is? Certainly. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of brawlers. Uh, for me, you know, they were a big, important genre growing up, late 80s, early 90s. Um you know, because they were a staple of the arcades as well in that time period. And for me, uh, Brawlers were a lot of fun. I loved Final Fight. I loved playing Streets of Rage, of course. But for me, my heart always belonged to the licensed cartoon ones. So the ones based off of comic books and cartoons, and that's Turtles, number one. Mm. Turtles in Time, specifically, is my favorite. Um but there's, of course, X-Men, specifically like the six-player X-Men there was in arcades. And um, Capcom did a Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Yep. Did Brawler. you play the Simpsons and, one? <laughs> well, because they all embody that same, you know, they all had the same huge characters. And that's one of the things I, we strive for right out of the gate was I want the game to have huge characters on screen. Um, good classic brawlers like river city ransom on the nes um even, and castle crashers as great as it is the characters still take up a very small portion of the screen i wanted the big tall huge colorful characters and although ourselves didn't have a cartoon to base it on the aesthetic was thinking about like what if there was this and that was mad max and this was the arcade game to go with that cartoon and that was kind of how we approached the aesthetic and big colorful cartoon brawlers and that's what we tried to make with this that that makes a lot of sense when when i think of it i, I got like you know a mad max sort of fist of the north star vibe certainly i'm glad good that came across and that's that means it was a success other than that are there any games you're currently diving into of late whether it be indie games tabletop stuff or just other odds and ends uh, yeah, uh, so I, like most people, um, am deeply in love with my Switch. And I've just been playing so much Switch, uh, especially over the holiday break. Um, just a ton of stuff. I mean, of uh, I've been playing a whole lot of Smash Brothers Ultimate. I think it definitely will go down as my game of the year 2018. As a big Smash Brothers fan myself, I had really high expectations going in. It's still like exceeded those expectations. I've been loving playing that. Um, and then I, I've been checking out a bunch of great indie games on it, like Yoku's Island Express, which is a really fun Metroidvania that has a pinball design to it. Hmm. So it's a Metroidvania platformer, but all of the levels are designed like pinball tables, and there's bumpers in the world that bounce you around. Fun, unique take on that. Need to get a link to that. Cause that sounds weird and quirky and i like weird and quirky it it definitely is weird and quirky and that's kind of my kind of vibe too um and then just today um actually just before this i downloaded double cross on the switch 
uh, an action platformer released by 13 a.m games who did uh, runbo hmm it's a fun it's a fun uh action platformer it's about working for this um kind of spy agency called rift that deals in exploring alternate dimensions so uh, the it seems that all the different worlds are like these different dimensions like there's a dinosaur dimension and future and so it has a bit of a time travel element too i think so they're a good team they make good stuff and uh like i said that just came out today so uh that's probably what i'm gonna be playing for the next few days keep me posted on it also let me know if any of these ever come out for steam because i do not own a switch weeps uh, i'm pretty sure both are as a matter of fact um i'll definitely be sharing some links uh to double check but i'm pretty certain both games are available on steam for sure oh heck yes but yeah um so i guess we'll i guess that works for our icebreaker questions so we'll start actually asking uh the things such as how long have you been in the video game industry so I've been making games professionally uh, since 2007. So I'm just coming up on 12 years being part of this industry right now. I've been all over the place. I got my start uh, working on mobile iPhone games. Actually, even before old uh, old Motorola flip phones, uh, one of my first jobs was working with Capcom on porting Mega Man 2 to the Razer phone. Oh man, that's such a good one too. Yeah, I mean that's that was an exciting thing. I mean it it definitely was a different game on mobile. The jump wasn't necessarily a hundred percent right, and it kind of ran at twelve frames per second. <laughs> but it was still thing and, and exciting. Um, but games can take you kind of all over the place, and I've gotten a good chance to work on kind of mobile games, console games, PC games freemium into metroidvanias and action games i kind of definitely am most happy in the last and basically in the last six years actually uh, in the last uh six years i've been working in the kind of the indie space and i've uh, been very lucky to work with a lot of cool teams on a lot of cool games like guacamole severed did not know that you had a tie to the guacamole folks wow yeah drink bunk studios um i worked there for a few years and got to work with those that excellent team they're they're excellent people they obviously make excellent games um um and yeah that's just been part of um uh part of kind of my growth uh, as i've kind of been doing this for just over for more than a decade um it's a whole lot of different experiences working on different scale games, small games, big games. And um, the one thing that's constant though, is that it's always, it's always exciting. And that's, uh, that's what I like most about it. That's why it's been, it's been a fun 12 years. So what got you into the whole game development scene in the first place? Um, I, I got into game development because it's something uh, I always wanted to do. Even when I was, even when I was very young in the '80s, uh, when I would be playing games, I, I got my start playing games on the Atari 2600 console and the Commodore 64 computer. One of my favorite games when I was five years old uh, was a Commodore 64 game called Wizard, just called Wizard. Um, you're a little purple wizard. You you it's a it was a platformer, and you just walked around uh, single screen levels. You had to pick up a key and take it to a door to exit. But the game uh, provided a level editor. Hmm. Actually, create your own levels. And as a little kid, I was like, "This is the greatest thing." You want you want me to do it? You want me to make a level? And I'm like, "This is neat." And of course, my first levels were not great. Um, but I, I kind of learned myself that I was like, oh, okay, you have to pay attention to how big the gaps you can jump are. And, oh, if you put a treasure up on a ledge that's hard to reach, it's a reward for the person to get to. Okay. Kind of over the years, gradually reinforced and taught those. And then even though it took years to get something that could let you make Mario levels, um, you know, as soon as I played Super Mario Brothers on the NES, I was immediately drawing out levels in graph paper. Um, 
and then into the 90s that involved that evolved into making doom wads maps starcraft campaign maps and just basically in the 90s kind of when i was growing up in the 90s give you mod tools or would give you a level editor i was just that would be my favorite thing my favorite games were the ones that let you build content and so from modding games and building custom maps kind of turned that into learning a little bit more about coding in a in a, in a serious sense and then kind of turned that into game dev was like okay you can take that and make full games completely original from that so it's kind of something my entire life that I just was building towards. So uh, actually f- sort of, I guess, touching into that and also what you mentioned about the things we're learning away, what sort of skills has game development required you to put to use and where did you develop them? I know you mentioned some of them came sort of naturally from tinkering around with like level editors. So I, I would say the earliest skill set that I learned and developed, and it took a long time, uh, was design. Uh, design, and by trade, uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm typically by trade a game designer. That's the role typically I'm always in when I work with studios. And uh, that's kind of the skill that I've been cultivating since I was young, like design. Design's always been my favorite. It's my favorite thing to do, and it um, it's always been the skill set I've worked the longest on. Throughout game, uh, my game development career, I've had to learn task management, team management, everything from being a lead to, with Household Games, running my own studio and running my own team. Uh, I've kind of had to adopt and quickly learn uh, team management, scheduling, budgeting, and that kind of stuff comes with being an indie. And when you're an indie, you realize that the biggest thing indies, I, I think, always point out from ones I talk to is you're always surprised how much more there is to releasing a game than making the game. Making the game is only part of it. And when you realize, oh, yeah, I've got to uh, realize I've got to set up publishing, I've got to market this thing. And when you're an indie, you've got to do that all by yourself. And so years that I've kind of been running household games, that's kind of more what I've been doing is kind of managing things from a high level. Um, those things I just kind of picked up working with other, with other teams. You know, when I've worked with other teams, I'd pay attention to how they did things and I learned things from them. Um, everywhere I've ever worked, I've always treated them as a mentor, would learn from them. And every place I've ever worked is basically, that's what taught me to be able to do what I'm doing today. Yeah. When you're mentioning like the marketing thing too, it just briefly had me think to like the current stuff with Steam, just because that's why a lot of uh, indie devs who I talk to and everyone are so annoyed at how they changed uh, their algorithm again. Yeah, that, 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 that's one of the trickiest parts. And that's the trickiest thing. I would say nowadays, because there's so many talented people you can collaborate with, and I was lucky to work with team members who helped make an awesome game. Making the game is the easier part. And then it's releasing a game is the hardest part. Because, yeah, run the marketplaces. There are people who run the stores and they can change the rules at any time and market change at any time. And you've got to be, you've got to adapt to that constantly. So it, it's its own challenge. Now you've mentioned like one of the easier parts right now is to sort of with all these talented people is to make the game, but how did you end up meeting the folks who uh, you made way of the pacifist with? Um, well, we uh, we're located in Toronto in Toronto, Canada, and You're practically neighbors to me. Excellent. Are you? Uh, you're in London. Yep. Yep. Um, well, Toronto just has of, but I would go as far as saying the uh, healthiest and best scene for game development in the world. I'm definitely. Uh, I, I will stand by that. Um, and Toronto just has 
so many professionals that uh, creative industries. Toronto is a big film town. Um, it's big with the music industry. And there's just so many creative professionals in Toronto. Developers is that they all like to work together and indie developers by their nature being smaller companies games know that they kind of need to rely on one another for help and advice. So the members of the team for the most part uh, were people I had worked with in the past at other companies or on other games and make this game. I already had pretty much everyone in mind that I, I just approached and talked to and said, Hey, I'm, I'm thinking about making a game right now. Work with me as my art director. Would you like to be my animator? Can you help me with the programming? And that, that it was just as easy as that. It's just because they were people I was familiar with and they were people I had already had experience with. So I already knew how great they all were. Lots of people. And so I just kind of approached them and said, here's, here's, here's my plan. Uh, I was very fortunate that all of the people I approached agreed and uh, they helped make it awesome. Yeah, I, I suppose that would be definitely an advantage for having worked like basically a third of my life in video games and getting to meet all those people. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. And and it's just those great relationships. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, the, the dev community is a very friendly one. It's a very friendly and warm one. So uh, it's easy to meet people and I've met nothing but great people. So, smaller, sillier question, but what's the origin behind the studio's name? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so how I came up with the name uh, Household Games was, um, you know, even when I've been working with other companies or uh, working full-time jobs, I've always been working on these little small side projects on my own and, you know, uh, most devs will always have some kind of side project and maybe it's not to make something to eventually sell or to show people, but it's just for your own kind of professional development. And there was a couple of years where I just was making things that were um, based off of household appliances. I made um, a, a prototype for a time travel game that was based on a calendar. So it was like, you look at a calendar but you could slide the dates around like one of those sliding picture puzzles. Oh, the dates on the calendar around to shuffle them to make new timelines. And the goal was you would see a month and like one of the days, like January 13th would be marked as like an apocalypse day. And it's like, well, if you can rearrange the calendar happen as the timeline, like ticks through the days, then that's how you'll stop the apocalypse. Just don't let that day happen by shuffling the calendar dates. But if you ever shuffled them that it would ever replay a day, you'd cause a time paradox and destroy the world anyway. So it was just a little prototype. Um, and I made a prototype based off of a toaster. It was a toaster. And I just was like, oh, yeah, I'm making all these household games. And I was like, oh, that's actually a fun title, I think. That's, and that, that's, that's how I came up with the title. That's actually really great. Uh, on the subject of, like, hobbies and side projects, are there any that, like, you specifically engage in just to help unwind from game dev-related stress or just, you know, work practices that help you keep that stress at healthy levels? Sure. Um, uh, so for me, um, playing playing games is fun, but I find you need to do a little bit more than that to kind of step further away when you need to take that break. Um, I'm a big fan of film. I love to watch movies, to unwind with movies. Um, being very fortunate, consider myself very lucky to be in Toronto. Toronto has a lot of really great movie houses and alt cinemas. All kinds of really cool stuff. Um, cause they're like, there's a, there's a theater in Toronto that, exclusively plays documentaries they don't play anything else they just play documentaries and there's all kinds of other movie theaters and like i said movie houses in town that host sing-alongs and b-movie showcases and horror film marathons nice. and lots of great content so like 
like I said, being a huge film fan and a big film geek, like there's all kinds of classic stuff you can check out stuff from uh, international directors. And uh, of course there's the film festivals in town or major film festivals that happen every year from TIFF, of course, uh, to hot docs, the Toronto documentary film festival. So and seeing what's going on in the world of film is usually a good way that I like to unwind. Yeah, I, I, I'm not the biggest person in the, I guess, the culture department. Because, like, there's neat stuff that happens in London, but all the things I remember are all food-related. And I, that might be just because I'm, like, subtly guided by my stomach and my need to eat different things. Well, that's, there's, that's amazing. Food festivals are a ton of fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, I mean, there's a lot of good restaurants in Toronto. Also, is Casa Loma as cracked up as, as it is and fun? Because I've, I, if I've gone there, I definitely don't remember it. It must have been when I was a child. So I want to know if it's worthwhile actually like going and doing a visit to there. It's, it's a fun place. So Casa Loma is most famous for being a popular filming destination. It appears in a lot of movies, you know, it acted as the X-Men's mansion in the X in the early X-Men movies. Scott Pilgrim. Um, but it's yeah, it, it, like Castle Loma's claim to fame is that it's a popular Hollywood films, a ton of movies there. Um, and nowadays uh, they do tours, but they also so they do a lot of, um, you know, the uh, room escape games. Don't they have secret uh, passages and stuff there? Yeah, so they've they've used some of that. Like they have a uh, they have one of those escape room games where you play a bunch of bootleggers. So you're playing the escape room game down in the secret tunnels and stuff. Oh, that's so neat. they've actually used the space very well, and they're hosting fun, interactive role playing stuff. That is awesome, actually. Okay, it really is. It's a good use of that space. So they they do good. They do fun stuff with it. Uh, so yeah, I, I suppose that answers most of the sort of real lifey about you and also mildly about Toronto because I'm in their questions. So uh, we'll move on to the way of the pacifist questions. And I'm going to start with the really obvious one of just what led to the inception of way of the pacifist, both in regards to like inspiration and just how it came to be. Certainly. Um, so being a big fan of beat em ups and brawlers, uh, I definitely wanted to set out to make one. And it's it's a genre that, you know, it, it's genre. Because, you know, brawlers are a genre that there really hasn't been much innovation in in forever. And they're a real, they're a stalwart genre. Like they're, you don't see too much uh, changes in them. And why specifically this kind of change and why I wanted to go with this type of gameplay was because I spent a few years making melee combat oriented games. A lot of the comments that would kind of from reviews and from players from these kind of action games that I was helping make was that, you know, the combat's really hard. And myself being a game designer, you know, I was the grumpy guy saying like, Fudge. <laughs> um, which was a comment I made regarding, you know, a game I had previously worked on. And when I, I'm a big fan of fighting games as well. And when I play fighting games, uh, I like to play a defensive style. You know, for me, um, although I'm not level or a, a tournament worthy player at all, I'm a, I'm I absolutely categorize myself as a casual fighting game player. Um, I still like to play defensively. For me, the game is about wait for them to do an unsafe move and react to it. That's kind of like how I like to play fighting games. Be patient, wait for someone to throw that unsafe fireball, and then you can capitalize on it and punish them. So kind of wanted to make a beat em up those design tenants, which is teach the player that it doesn't have to be about button mashing. Teach them that patience its own way. And when you wait for that exact right moment, it's satisfying. And that's kind of what the game is really about. It's teaching the player patience to look out for those moments they can capitalize on. They'll boom, they'll get that one hit and they will just 
they will lay waste to their opponents. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of... I think one of the moments that really made that stick out in my head was... I think it was Diago versus uh, Justin Wong. Uh, yes, yeah, Diago versus Justin Wong, the Evo moment 37. Yeah, just fucking destroyed him. And it was just, you know, punishing that single move. Uh, it, yeah. yeah. And it's one of the most exciting moments in gaming history, as far as I'm concerned. And take that. Now, of course, that specific moment, it wasn't to recreate that moment because what that, why that moment is special is not everyone can do that. People yeah, no. The world could do it. But the idea was to take that feeling and take that satisfaction and let. And. You know, to me, for anyone that asks, like, well, why not, is like, well, for for people who enjoy playing Madden football, if you feel like you're good enough to win the Super Bowl, it's not to actually make you win the Super Bowl, because not everyone gets to do that, but it's to make you feel as cool as the person who won the Super Bowl. That's the goal. So that's the same kind of, that's what we went for. Overall, that like, just, it, it's a bit interesting when I think about it on that level it's like this this thing of reflecting your style of how you play fighting games because it it makes me think about it a lot differently than i i would have because like when i played it how i thought about it is like this is sort of like a rhythm game <laughs> because you very much do fall into this rhythm as you're like parrying and dodging because of the way like the attacks come and that they end up being you're able to predict them which mm -hmm. you're not quite yeah. able to do as readily in like a fighter normally yep so i i ended up getting this sort of it's a rhythm game feel almost or in like very much recognizing patterns mechanics and the like so it's interesting to know like it's its foundations for how that came to be was actually based off like that you're a very defensive player inversely i'm a horribly reckless trash player <laughs> uh, like i played uh f to give you an example of the horrible trash i am i would play uh snk versus capcom with mm -hmm. dan yuri and sakura and could just beat the worst. <laughs> hey, I call that bold. I think anyone would call that just that's bold. Uh, well, like Yuri is just rewarding because you know she has like the rush at them and slap. It just mm. it, it was like team cancer was what it was because because <laughs> oh, yeah. you just you, you get them and if you ever manage to stun them, you super taunt. That's oh, yeah, exactly. that, that, that's that's why it's you there. Yeah, that's the, that's why you play Dan. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. No, but um, very early on, people identified the rhythm aspect to it, and that was yeah. That see, example of how you can set out with design goals, and then as you kind of develop those goals, things we came into or we came up with was we realized okay. As a game designer, I want players to approach the game this way, but how do we help them and how do we engage them? And that's where the rhythm aspect came from because the rhythm aspect is what people could latch on to to go like, oh, I get it. There's a rhythm to this that I can follow. I can sing along to these punches. So you picked up on just the right stuff. I mean, it also helps that the enemies... Uh the audio design in the game i found pretty on point because like even if i wasn't necessarily looking they would like grunt and make sound effects in tandem with the motion they had a lot of good tells yes that was thank th thank you thank you um i'll pass that along to the sound designer and the, and the animators as well it was very important to us to marry very carefully sound and visuals yeah the game has a very clear animation and a very clear sound to go with it and we found that you know people can people can play the game without looking at the screen and likewise people can play the game with the sound muted but 
anyone who's playing with both stimuli just gets an even better reinforced experience. But you can play without sight, you can play without sound, and if you're playing with both, you just get double reinforced, and it helps everybody. So that actually ties really nicely into Mike's question, but feature-wise, how central was uh, just the customizable difficulty to wave the passive fist and overall that sense of accessibility. That, um, that was really important from the beginning. And that was, that was, those were goals that were set up even before the game started production. When we were in the pre-production phase and just planning, like, what is this game going to be before we even drew a character or made a level, we planned out the accessibility stuff and the, um, the difficulty stuff. Um, actually the difficulty stuff came from the accessibility and this once again is just from my experience I'd worked on many games and I worked on games before where the studio would get emails from people saying oh hey I'm I'm colorblind and your game is asking me to line up green blocks and the green the orange and the red blocks all look exactly the same I can't tell them apart so I actually can't beat your level or players that couldn't um they couldn't change the controls they're like oh hey just, uh, you know i'm uh i use the controller differently and so i actually it's really hard for me to pull the trigger really fast button and the company i worked for just uh didn't do anything about it so part of one of the perks of you know i was like you know what i'm gonna do my best to get way ahead of that before we even start making the game. Let's talk to people. Let's meet with people in the accessibility community and let's, let's get them to tell us. And I consulted with a lot of different people and they gave me great advice and all that stuff passed on to the entire team. The artists were told color blindness sound designer was told, here's some stuff you need to know game design. I made sure before we even started writing a line of code, I talked with my lead programmer and I said, like, make sure these aren't hard coded. The button presses can be changed at any time. And told in advance, nothing had to be redone. Nothing had to be rebuilt. Nothing had to be redone. It was all built with that stuff um, from the get go. So it was easy to do too the lesson I've been trying to tell to other indie developers specifically, because they're smaller is just that if you plan from the beginning, um, all that stuff is just automatic because a lot of the problem, especially with indie devs is when you find out after you've colored all your characters and someone says like, Oh, that one character, that one color isn't a good choice. And you stop to think, and then you have to recolor all these animations, all these elements, that's your problem. But if you plan it from the beginning, super easy and not a problem. And discussions of accessibility, one of my accessibility experts, he said, oh, have you ever thought of cognitive and motor ability accessibility? And I hadn't really thought about that. And it told me about people that have a uh, lower than average um, time or players that can become overwhelmed with too much stuff happening on the screen. And then when I kind of stopped and thought about what that meant for planning, I was like, well, ad guys that are on screen and how quickly you have to react. I was like, those are things we would normally build into difficulty. Hmm. Is that we should just take them, separate them all. So instead of the game having easy, normal, hard, um, and normal, I actually don't like as a term. So, um, if I were to only use settings in three ways, I would call them easy, medium, hard. I don't like using the word normal because I don't like implying that anyone should not play on normal. Um, out the things like how hard enemies hit you, how many enemies are on screen at once, how narrow your timing needs to be. And we let people say, well, I want to fight a bunch of guys with easy timing or... I want to fight only one guy at a time, but with the hardest possible timing and let people kind of you to, it's, it's a menu of a difficulty buffet. Yeah. I, I kept the timing on like medium. I, I, I was like, I can do medium going into the higher end of the timing. Not, not so much it was, it was good though. 
Oh, I was gonna say, well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad. Anyone who anyone who took the time to adjust those sliders and alt and customize it to their own experience makes me happy. That's exactly what we wanted. We wanted a difficulty as unique as the player. Also, I like the fact that it gave like custom titles and also changed the animation of the dude in like the start menu. Was good. Perfect. Awesome. Good. That was that was just a little touch. I actually um, just talking about like uh, this is a quick aside about the different kind of tools and things that program uh, game developers use is the, the whole name and picture adjustment based on the difficulty thing. The prototype for that, I actually didn't write in code. I actually made it in Excel. Hmm. Set up Excel with like these strings and I set it up with these variables and like I, I, I basically built the first version of the difficulty screen as an Excel spreadsheet that you could adjust and it would generate the name and it would generate the picture. That makes a lot of sense with some of the names that you get because they're just like these <laughs> epically lengthy things. I'm like, hmm, yep. Yep, the... yep. Nobody, yeah, exactly. Nobody plays on easy or hard here. People play on way of the enduring, uh, persistent, uh, quick-witted traveler. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I think if I was ever going to do difficulty for a game... I would probably just make them hot sauce bottles and then make it like how much the hot sauce bottle is full or just add more more like different things. <laughs> so have like the easy be honey garlic mm -hmm. and then the normal be barbecue and then hard just be suicide. It's good. <laughs> the analogy the analogy works really well. It's a nice yeah, exactly. But yeah, uh, for those who like pain, <laughs> basically. <laughs> People should know what they're signing up for. Exactly. Same way when they're picking out their wing sauce flavor. Exactly. That's what that's what you'd be, be ready for. I mean, the hot sauce that sits on my desk is called Momento de Muerte. So, I mean, <laughs> go figure that I'm a roguelike player. <laughs> yeah. Now, admittedly, I, I mentioned I dug the pun in the game title. Uh, how long did it take you guys to figure it out? And were there any other runner-ups for a title for the game? No, actually. Uh, the initial title for the game was just Passive Fist. Huh. Just kind of sitting around one day, I was like, Passive Fist. Actually, I will say, I just did a quick search online, and in IMDb, there is a movie called Passive Fist. Uh, and I was like, oh, it's a weird low budget movie no one's ever seen. Um, said it out loud and I looked it up. I was like, yeah, but Passive Fist isn't isn't enough. And my favorite uh, martial arts films, as well as kind of how we wanted to take the player on this journey, kind of naturally went in and it made sense right away. It, it all just clicked. Fair enough. So, was the combat always as streamlined as it currently is? Combat was super fun and went through a lot of growing pains. Um, to get to the iteration it is now, so for anyone that hasn't played it, um, or actually just to explain, I guess we didn't. I didn't really take the time to explain the game. There's going to be gameplay footage behind this interview to make it okay. a bit easier <laughs> so if people are seeing it cool then one of the things they'll be seeing is that the enemies are aggressive they get in your face real quick and the reason to do that is when you play old brawlers uh and the tempo of the fight is entirely on the player when you look at streets of rage and final fight the enemies don't engage they kind of just walk in random figure eight patterns or they just kind of like pace back and forth Smack it makes them. things you walk easy. Up and punch them. It makes it really um, easy to control. And the player never feels bored because they're constantly like, oh, I'm going to go punch that guy. Now that guy. Whereas in our game, you can't do anything until the enemy attacks. That's the thing. And that, that is on purpose. That was the number one onus of the game is that ever throw the first punch. Uh, they always throw the first punch. You always throw the last. Hey. In our in our first um, in our first prototypes, we just we just like yeah, make the enemies just like Streets of Rage enemies. 
Mm. It would sit there like at the ready because you're like, yeah, I'm going to parry whatever they do to me. But the enemies are kind of like, yeah, I'm just walking randomly. I'm at the side of the screen. I'm not doing much. And um, players would have trouble getting in like the very first time we showed it off publicly. People would have trouble playing because they wouldn't get it. So they would walk up to the guy and they would just like flick their wrist and parry at him a bunch going like, come on, like do something, do something. Enemy would click and go, oh yeah. And then throw a punch and they'd parry it. So we realized that because the enemies are driving the fight, not the player, a gap, there can't be any emptiness. And so basically the player has like two little invisible dots, uh, one on each side of them. And basically all the enemies, the enemies are actually like way more aware and sophisticated than your average beat up because the enemies are all player. And if the player is not currently fighting a dude, somebody goes in, but so that way they don't double up. And so that it's unfair, every enemy is also paying attention to every other enemy. So constantly while the game's running, every bad guy is communicating to every bad guy. And the second someone's not fighting they all agree and they go okay it's you go in right now so you'll see a dude dash right in if he gets punched away or he um if he gets punched away or knocked down then someone else fills that in every enemy has a built-in rhythm to like like you mentioned earlier to their attacks so every enemy is like well i go in and i go like punch punch grab haymaker. punch Grab And then when they do their thing, they're like, okay, I'm out and I'm letting someone else get their turn in. And they switch themselves out. So every enemy is always paying attention to every other enemy. And when the player is not currently, I'm like, okay, we got to go fight because we got to fill in that blank space. You can't have a time when the player's just sitting there waiting to get punched. So that's why initially all the bad guys had walk cycles, but then we realized walking is way too slow. And that's why they jump, they dash. They slide. They get right in your face constantly. Um, didn't have any any dead air. We couldn't have any time the player was sitting there. If the player was ever wishing someone would hit them, that's not good. <laughs> we're like, no, we're going to throw them at you constantly. That makes a lot of sense. And honestly, like, I think it works better with the idea of like the way of the pacifist because inversely, if you had to like walk up to them to con them into throwing a punch at you it's less passive fist and like way of the provoking fist <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and it just wasn't it wasn't meeting the goal of the game that we set out so very quickly while we were prototyping while we were developing it we were like yeah this isn't working the way we want but and that's how the combat became as streamlined as it is but it was through a lot of iteration and many many attempts so there's like the main game and it had its specific challenges nuance, but then you get the new dawn and the passive verse, both of which offer some rather distinct challenges uh, compared to the main campaign. I myself hit a brick wall with the passive verse, pa passive verse. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what led to their inception and overall with them and also the main game, what was the hardest challenge? Um, <clears throat> so Passiverse, so New Dawn and Passiverse uh, were both released after the game initially launched. Um, and when we initially launched the game, we had modes that I that ultimately, I think, didn't succeed in the goals we wanted to. Um, mode, which was 10 chapters, uh, well and then we had the alternate arcade mode and the arcade mode just asked you to play the same 10 levels over again basically rules and you had a limited number of lives but it was the same thing over again and admittedly that wasn't doing exactly what like that wasn't as good as it could have been the update we uh, or one of the first updates we released after we launched three months later we released uh, the new dawn update which introduced new dawn which was five brand new levels and the goal of New Dawn, basically the story mode away of the pacifist is designed to be a nice, gentle learning curve. We gradually make it more complex. We gradually ease the player into new concepts. You know, they're blocking punches. Then they learn to dodge grabs. 
Then they're grabbing projectiles out of the air and throwing them back. And then New Dawn is just the to learn. Now these are the the toughest challenges we can think of. These are specifically designed to test you and to be. So we have faster enemies. We have enemies that don't hesitate. We um, we just kind of added a lot to it. The first boss is a gigantic bastard. <laughs> That's fair. That's kind of what, like, even even yesterday, last night, I noticed there was still some new posts in the Steam forum from people that don't like Redux. He's uh, he's tricky. Um, oh, I, f I beat him because I've beat, like, New Dawn I beat. Past the first, I, I did not. I got to the first boss at Past the first and then just got smeared across a wall. Um, that's that's also fair um so yeah so new dawn is just a lot harder and passiverse is um because way the pacifist is a game about uh reaction it's a game about rhythm like you've mentioned so many times and it's also as some people have pointed out a game about memorization I said oh I, I got through the game by memorizing the enemy patterns memorizing their rhythms and then it was just execution i got through it so Passiverse, very little bit, very little bit um, uh, of that roguelike mentality into it. So we shuffle things up. It has randomized levels, and you even upgrade your character in a from random pickups. So it introduces a little bit of chaos. Say, okay, so now instead of just memorizing all of the enemies that are in the levels, let's see... This is about more about freestyling. This is about how is your reaction in the moment? How can you handle constantly react second to second? So that's what the Pacifist seeks out. So it's sort of like, it's it's the way the Pacifist final exam. You've, you know all of your equations, you know all of the material, but it's like now on the fly, can you pick pick out which ones we need and can you pull from your tool of tricks at the right time. So it's it's really the truest test. It's kind of, that was the goal of it. And it is hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for that reason, because yeah, you don't get to just retry and like you do have to restart the mode each time and each time it will be slightly different. So it's uh, it's not forgiving at all. It's, it's not by design, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, enemies doing max damage when you're back at base health hurts badly yes. <laughs> but yeah uh overall like i actually really enjoyed new dawn uh the first boss is a bastard but it's because i believe he functions differently from any others including being like unparryable and undodgeable like yes, you, his... you specifically have to stay at range from him and parry and counter his minions until you can use them for a ground slam or I did the stupid gravity well on him once and was like, you know, I should have just like grand slam twice here. Yeah, but it's, it's, it, it is about that risk. Um, but yeah, in that case, the grab well is not worth the risk. You're better off just do the slam. Yeah. And you know, Thornborn, that boss, like for a lot of the game, because like we talked about earlier, because the enemies run the combat and the enemies will always run up to you. They'll put themselves in your face and throw their punches you can fight a lot of the game without moving. And because the enemies will just, they'll come left, they'll come right, but like you can plant yourself. And while we were developing the combat, we even at one point had a score multiplier that was based on if you didn't move. You lost your multiplier if you moved. Oof. <laughs> but then we realized that wasn't working. Um, but there are some people who play the game never moving, and that's a viable strategy except at this point where it's not. And we specifically boss fight. We're like, you've got to learn to move the fight and the enemies will always follow you. So don't be afraid to move. You can parry guys one punch and then dash away from him. He'll follow you. So he can do that next punch. Don't worry about that. And it's, we have this walking death zone and we're like, it'd be to avoid the walking death zone. The fight will follow you. Don't worry about it. You don't need to worry about, will there be enough punches later? Will I build my meter? The one thing I do wish is I just wish there was a better indication of how large the death zone was at times. Because it was a sort of trial and error of realizing like, oh, I'm going to die now. 
especially because you know it's sometimes really easy to fall into that pattern of like you're getting a good bunch of like parries on you're getting up to the suit and then you just like whoops i wasted yeah. too much time and he clips me with his tail again and keeping it ambiguous is kind of is is something that i still think is important to it um I've gotten we've gotten our fair share of vocal people who are <laughs> letting us know, which is which is totally fine. It's it's how we made New Dawn in the first place. I mean, it's good That's overall. Feedback. I actually really enjoyed it, including uh, I enjoyed the way that it sort of went in reverse. That was neat. How it sort of did like remixed versions of the different levels and was like your journey in reverse. That's all awesome. Good. I'm I'm glad you picked up on that. That if that came across, that's another. I'm happy about that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that that was like my one big remark about it. It's just, god damn it, that boss is such a prick. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, he's not the only thing you can't block or dodge though, because there's also the shadow warriors who actually have to like use the dash to get away from. Yes, so. Uh, Shadow Warriors weren't in the original version of the game, and actually Shadow Warriors were introduced as part of New Dawn, even into the story mode, to teach you to move a little bit before you get to that boss. They were like the precursor of like, sometimes you're going to have to move. Oh, that makes a lot of sense now. I'm glad I learned that lesson. Too bad it still took me like a couple lives to figure... Because I tried, like, maybe I can perfect parry it. Maybe I can. And I actually pulled off the perfect parry the one time. I was like, yeah. And then I just go flying and I'm like, fuck. <laughs> well, if, if I mean, it's it's one thing for me to explain it right here, but I can't always be there to explain. So if the game didn't make that 100% clear, that's a failure of the game. That's something that we can look at and see what we can do better. Yeah, because, I mean, it's like one of those things of, like, the Shadow Warrior has that really horrible you, you you figure quick that he's going to wreck you no matter what you do because you try and then it happens but because the dude was a boss and asked so far all of the bosses you got by them by specifically because you can't kill the Shadow Warriors have their lesson they teach you which is you need to avoid him and drop everyone else and then you can drop him mm hmm that boss has a ton of minions, but they infinitely come, which mm. teaches you the lesson of, okay, so if I can't stop them by the minions, it didn't click for me at first. Like, oh, I need to dunk them. Because remember, I avoid reviews, so I had no yep. idea yep. until after. Yep. And then I'm like, oh, son of a bitch. Not the <laughs> only one. Yep, no, that's, that's, that's totally fair. And it's like part of stuff we look at. But yeah, that was... Yeah, that that's overall my whole thoughts. And yeah, overall, though, he's actually really neat just because he's like, I guess, the only puzzle boss in the game, really. Yeah, he is. He is the game's puzzle boss for sure. He's my favorite. But yeah, he's he's the he's the puzzle boss. You nailed it. Yep. Yeah, which was actually really interesting when I stepped back and looked at it. There was just like, yeah. He, he he's a vicious thing to find is the first one he's literally the hardest part of uh new dawn for me the guy who like bounces around the mind boss was also pretty tricky oh dredge yeah he's neat his remix is interesting and was tricky to get the timing for the parries on his stuff and like redirecting myself to like because you know you could parry him forward and if you're too close to the wall He'll then bounce off the wall and plow right through you and ruin your combo. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, <laughs> yep. oh, feels bad. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, he was a neat fight to learn. Honestly, the final boss of New Dawn is the easiest one. Really? I actually, I find him the hardest. He's the only boss I can't always beat without getting hit. Uh, the okay. clones are The clones are relentless. <laughs> The clones are relentless, but I figured out their timing for Ooh. dropping them, and they're aggressive enough that it means you can generally get charge off. Like, I actually have a harder time. I basically dealt with him the same way that I dealt with the, uh, with the first boss mm. of it. So just shockwaved him into oblivion and called it a day. Because they're robots, so they never exhaust. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
And, and yeah, because like parrying him, honestly, is sometimes a pain in the butt. Like I figured out later on that you could parry the wheel and but I originally actually dealt with him by just getting up in his face and annoying him until he tried smacking me and charging up off his minions mainly. Mm, that's perfect. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I comparatively to like dredge and the other guy found him easier. I'm not going to perfect him or anything, but I, I never died to him. That's, that's fair. That's good. But like that, that's also fair. Fair point. Um, so okay, I we we've talked just random rambly bits about the game. Uh currently I just like to know if there's anything that was cut from way of the pacifist that you really wanted to see in the game or just notable manners in w- which this title changed over the course of its development that we haven't touched on. Sure. Um the biggest change would be the combat and I think we touched on that a whole lot. The only thing that was cut from the game is something not really gameplay related. It was just something I really couldn't get in. Um, I have an incredibly unnatural, unhealthy fondness for at the end of games, whenever they show you all the names of the enemies. Oh. Super Mario World. Or specifically, my favorite one of all is actually the end of Turtles in Time. When you finish Turtles in Time on hard mode, surfer music and it like does a little vignettes of like it it shows like a foot soldier punch leo and then it like says foot soldier and it does a little like each boss like gets their one second in the spotlight i love those things those things fill my heart with joy rogue legacy and full metal furies had their thing too where yeah. it would like show all them uh he totally I- does and it's really nice because you see the evolution of the as they um like uh, the three stages of night and the three stages of wizard. Yeah. Yeah. I love those things at the end of games. Anytime they do something like that, I, like I said, I get extra happy and I really wanted to do one for way of the pacifist, but those things where at the end of the day, when you're trying to ship a game and I could get my animator to make that, or I can actually get him to fix these bugs where the boss anim- is not animating properly. Um, and even for other games I've worked on in the past, I've wanted to include that kind of thing. And it just, it's always the thing that gets cut. You pick the end of the day, wisely. make your game work and be bug free is way more important. Um, but that's literally the only thing that got cut. I'd say. Uh, in which case, so is there any more content coming for Where the Pacifist, or is it currently in its final form? Uh, no, there is. Um, okay, uh, there is work being done on Where the Pacifist, and I can't go into specifics at this time, unfortunately, but I can say that I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Okay, so I should keep it on my Steam list installed, because there's more stuff coming. They're, 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 uh, yeah, they're, um, mm. <laughs> you're like mm. maybe. maybe i yeah I'm, I'm getting so close to saying things i shouldn't but um i'm actively working on way the pacifist stuff and that's all i can really say right stuff. now stuff okay is there I, mm, how do i word this can players who currently own way of the pacifist is there you know if they beat the game is there more to come in the current iteration of it not in the current iteration of it. The current iteration of it is is fully there. Okay. Um, I'm working on letting new players get the game. Oh. Oh. Maybe. So new players are going to get the game. Players who who haven't who haven't been able to play it until until soon, and that version is going to have some some new stuff in it, and then maybe we'll get the new stuff too groovy and is one of those things going to be that end screen you want <laughs> it still won't be because oh, rip. something something useful for players still is more important um and i would say for people who are stuck on passiverse I help you with passiverse but that's where i'm going to draw the line ah ah 
So I'm going to lean away from spoilers now to instead ask just, uh, do you have a specific favorite moment of watching someone play the game? Yeah, it, it's always been. Um, and I, I'd say more so than even like, you know, even with awesome games I've been able to work on in the past, even with all the games uh, I've ever made in my career with this game, more than any of those it has a very strong clicking moment. You see someone playing it when they're streaming it or a YouTube video where they start off going like, I'm not too sure. And then you, uh, it's happened to me a couple times and it's my favorite feeling is I've seen someone become Neo throughout their stream. <laughs> like I've seen them like not quite get it, not quite struggle with it. And then there's several levels in they're like, Oh yeah, I'm never getting hit ever again. Boof, 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 boof. And that feels good. That's the best. It's when you see it and you see it happen in real time and you see it click with the player. And that is the most, that's my favorite. And it's the most touching. I was never quite Neo. I was always a bit too sloppy and risky because I do things like dashing onto a guy I specifically wanted to fight versus someone else because mm -hmm. some of them, I what is it? The range people would sometimes do things like toss something and someone would go in to go and like smack me. And so they'd interrupt. So it's like I was very proactive about controlling where I was and who I was trying to engage. Because it does favor who's closer to you for, like, who's showing up. Yes. Never had that Neo moment, though. Though I was at least like, oh, yeah, pull off gravity well. That was a thing that happened. That's, 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 all, that, that's, a, that's a, that's a close moment. Anyone that can get to, you know, uh, no, I, yeah, that it, it, you're getting glimpses of it because you have to build a high combo to get the grab well. So getting that much, like, when you think of it, you've, parried and dodged and avoided that much damage like five times enemies tried to hit you and they couldn't you know avoiding 25 straight attacks is awesome i suppose this is sort of the part where we should like wind down the interview so uh i guess at this juncture you've mentioned that you're currently working on some stuff for pacifist is there anything else that you're currently working on and would you be able to provide insight on it uh, nothing uh nothing really right now like i said i'm doing some work on that um i'm you know like, like i talked about that collaborative and friendly indie environment um i'm working with another team uh their game's not announced it's entirely their game i'm just helping out on it so it's a cool game but i you know it's not my place to even talk, even hint about it um just, um, uh, like I said, on Twitter and anytime there's new news, I'll kind of share it on there pretty much. Which I suppose on that subject, are there any indie projects that you want to share with the audience right now? Um, yeah, top of the show, I'd say like for exciting brand new releases, um, like things that come to mind, like I said, 13 a.m. release Double Cross on, I'm 99% certain it's on Steam and the Switch as well. Um checked out guacamole 2 i recommend list. it um <laughs> melee 2 was exciting because i had nothing to do with it so for me it was like oh this is how people felt when they played guacamole for the first time so i loved guacamole 2 it turned out really really well it's an awesome sequel and like i said for me it was exciting because i got to play it fresh really really exciting guacamole is at its best when it's fresh Exactly. Exactly. It's it's the best way. Guacamole and like guacamole is the same thing. Guacamole is just the same. Fresh is best. Um, but yeah, th those would be two indie projects. I'd say uh, for anyone that hasn't had a chance to check out either, they definitely should. All right. And so do you have any final words for the folks watching, whether it be just for the normal viewers or those aspiring devs in the audience? Sure. Um, for uh, I guess I, I hope for anyone that hasn't had a chance to try Way of the Pacifist, I've made it sound interesting and exciting, and I hope uh, it's worth checking out. Actually, aspiring devs, um, game development is an excellent and awesome creative industry. It needs all kinds of different voices. 
It's an industry that benefits greatly from diversity and from getting people with different backgrounds. Question that I get asked often is, you know, what kind of person can be a game dev? And the answer is anyone and anyone with any skill set are an artist who creates interesting characters or wants your story told. If you're a technically minded person that wants to help game, make games more stable, run better, there's a place for you. If you're not, if you're an artist who doesn't typically do digital or drawing and you're like, well, I'm a sculptor. You know what? I think there's an awesome way to get claymation games made or a game. Like anybody's background, anybody's voice can help make games better. So anyone can do it. And like I said, we're going to get the coolest, most unique. I love the unique and quirky games. If you're like, I've made a clay, a game where we didn't actually have sprites. We made it entirely out of claymation and it's about the history of Russian movies. I'm like, yes, I want that game more than anything. Clay fighter um, revengeance. Yes. But anyone with any kind of background, anyone's unique voice is welcome in games and can help make games better. That's my biggest come make games fair enough so for those folks watching you can find household games on twitter at hh games inc uh they also have a handy dandy website you can check out at household-games.com as well as wave of the pacifist.com and there's totally going to be a steam link down below in the description to this video is there anywhere else you want to send anyone at this juncture uh, no, that's actually perfect. Everything you can learn about Way of the Pacifist or the stuff that we do next will definitely appear there. And uh, yeah, appreciate I appreciate the time you've taken out to chat and uh, the time anyone's taken out to listen too. Oh, it was a lot of fun. A, a ton of fun. Love talking about making games and about this and like all of your insights into what your experience playing it was. That's That's literally the stuff I live for. Sweet. Glad I could actually be of service. Uh, amazing thank you so much but yeah to the folks currently watching then uh first off if you enjoyed this uh feel free to hit that like button but other than that if you have any comments that you'd like to pass on feel free to use the description box to let me know what you didn't like what you did like or any questions you may or may not have beyond that uh other than that if you do want to see more developer interviews or indie game reviews feel free to hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon to get notifications when we next do something anywho uh, this has been arlian and also uh jason thanks a lot for listening for watching yeah thanks for watching see you later folks